Hi, I'm Lexi Ralph. I'm the PTSA president from Eagle Staff Middle School, and I'm here to talk about the capacity issues that we have. Now that our brand new school is at capacity this year, we're adding 100 students next year, and probably 100 the year after that, and the actions that we need to proceed with in order to make this uh, better situation for everybody involved. So I have four requests today for you. The first request is please provide updated capacity calculations so we can understand the scale of the solution that we need to have in place. Uh, this thousand student number has been floating around. That magic number is wrong because you've given a third of the school to Licton Springs, which leaves two thirds of the school for Eagle staff. So that's only about 670 students' capacity. So we're over capacity this year as a result. Um, so even though Licton Springs is only about 70 percent full, we can't assume their extra capacity is available for us given the current space allocations. So 700 be, would be a better goal post at this point, if we're keeping that in our minds, but better calculations would be very helpful. Request number two is please provide something in writing that the portables are really a temporary solution and not a permanent temporary solution. Uh, parents and staff are definitely a little bit stressed out about that. Um, and certainly the fact that they're in front of the murals is another issue. Um, hopefully one year maximum, two at the most. So uh, that's also for some accountability so that we do progress to a solution we can all live with. Um, request number three, have a long-term plan in place by this fall, not right before open enrollment. Whatever we need to do, whether it's boundaries or um, changing pathways, please have it in place by fall so everybody can plan accordingly. And request number four, please allow grandfathering this time around. It's been very um, turbulent for the eighth graders. So those are our four requests. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Camille Heinen and I'm the mother of a sixth grader at Robert Eagle Staff Middle School and a fourth grader who is a future Raven. Um, as an observer in last week's capacity meeting, I learned that the plan for fall of 2018 is to add three to four portables for Eagle Staff. These portables are being placed in a location that students use on a daily basis to get fresh air, um, get a little exercise during their lunch break. Additionally, these portables will be blocking the murals that the district relocated from the demolished building during construction, and I'm pretty sure that cost a bit of money to do that. So it's, it's um, frankly a little embarrassing that the district's capacity projections were so clearly off after one year of opening that the portables are necessary. Um, but this is where we are. Obviously, it's hard to make changes to alleviate the overcapacity issue this fall, um, but I'm asking you to make some decisions that will impact 2019 and beyond. First of all, like Lexi, I'd like you to commit to getting rid of the portables after one year of use. Portables are not a good long-term solution, and they shouldn't be used as such. Secondly, I'm asking that you use data-driven decisions to come up with a plan to address the capacity issues long-term. Um, that could be adjusting the allocation of the two schools that are within the building, or it could be difference in the student assignment plan. Um, we would like this to be communicated to families by the end of the year, by the fall, so that they can make plans um, before open enrollment hits the first part of 2019. Lastly, if boundaries do change, please consider grandfathering um, for our rising eighth graders. Uh, we've heard from families, like Lexi said, that it's been tough for those that have had to move this year. Thank you for your time. Thank you. This concludes the public testimony list this evening. Okay, we are back to board comments. Who would like to go next? Board comments? Director DeWolf? Director Geary, I'm playing hot potato yeah, here. Boy, yeah, Thank you as always for everybody um, coming out to speak to us. Uh, we appreciate your input. Um, thank you to our Stevens Elementary. I, I, since I'm going first after so much that I, I figure like I'm gonna do the broad thank yous and then everybody can go yes and add their two bits. But I feel like it's important to start out with a thank you to the Stevens um, Elementary Choir. Um, clearly, uh, and their teacher who focused their songs definitely on sending a very positive message to their community. Very upbeat, bright, welcoming. Um, so I thank them all for, for their contribution to their school and to our board meeting. Um, 
Thank you as well to our Rainier Beach students. I think you guys get the award for showing up and participating in this process. I, we talk a lot about a student advisory board, um, and that's something that we've actually put on, I've asked to be put on the agenda for our next exec, so we're gonna move forward with that. But you guys have been our de facto student advisory showing up so often um, and championing for Rainier Beach. I really appreciate it and I will miss you when you're, done, when you're not here as much next year, but you're gonna be busy doing great things. Um, and congratulations on, on going to Cornish. My niece graduated there from there last year and I was so impressed. I mean, I think you'll just find it so lovely to be around people who share your creative passion and get to expand your vision and share with them. I went to their um, shows at the end of the year where I got to see everybody's art and I was just overwhelmed with how beautiful it was and how beautiful the people were in terms of expressing themselves just in their being as you are today. So I hope you have a great career and I think you'll be very happy there. And engineering, awesome for you too, Jean. I was so happy to hear it because I think maybe that's your first step to becoming an architect, which I think you may enjoy one day. Certainly you're passionate. Um, the Bex Oversight Committee has been appreciated and welcomed by all of us. Um, I've made a lot of different visits and meetings um, since our last. I was went to the special ed PTSA meeting um, to share what was going on and I just continue to encourage us all to break down the barriers and to figure out ways to continue to communicate across all the different groups of people because I think you hear everybody sharing the same interest and wanting our schools to change so that people feel safe and included in every school and that will continue to be something I will work for. They were very interested to hear about the technology task force um, and so I again implore those in charge of putting that together to be sure to include people who have um, voices around assistive and adap adaptive technology because I think that needs to be an important part of how we go forward. Uh, Director DeWolf and I had the great pleasure to visit uh, NOVA uh, with Principal Dr. Mark Perry and I think we both just loved that vision of a school where clearly every student there just, you could almost walk in and feel like at some point they exhaled the way I did when I walked into that environment. It is so colorful and welcoming and clearly a place where students and their ideas are on the pedestal and shaping every day in that school. They talked about being hidden under an invisibility cloak because people don't seem to know that NOVA is there and what a wonderful um, environment that celebrates the individuals. So if anybody out there is looking to visit a school that is so inspiring and you think your students' individuality, individuality will be put first and that's something that is important to them, I would encourage you to go see that school. It was, it, for me it was just lovely. I loved every minute that I was in that building. Um, with uh, Director Patu and I visited Emerson Elementary and thank you to Principal Aaron Rasmussen for sharing the good news um, about uh, Emerson and I'll let Director Patu talk about some of that but one of the things that she shared that I thought was just something I want to give a big thank you to the Pacific Science Center because they not only invite the Emerson Elementary School and provide them an opportunity for a field trip but they tailor the field trips specifically to the grade level that is coming to them and so I just think that that willingness to participate to offer something so individualized for our kids uh, is wonderful and I encourage and thank, I encourage further types of coordination between our community partners and thank them for taking the time and effort to reach out to Emerson Elementary and provide something that was clearly appreciated um, by the administration there. Also jumped by South Lake High School and visited with Principal uh, Laura Davis Brown for a little bit and got to see it is her dream to turn South Lake into an art-centered school as well down in, near Rainier, in Rainier Beach. Um, and watching her move um, 
what they want to focus on is the mu music production for their kids so that their kids can have experience in, in music production. And so I'm hoping to find somebody out there in the greater community who would love to help support them in that because they will need some additional resources and supplies and moving that dream forward for their kids. But I think it would be really exciting for that community to have a focus within their school that is obviously something that's important to a lot of kids and that they can relate to. Thornton Creek um, Elementary. Uh, we heard from several of our parents last board meeting, but since then I've had a chance to meet with their new, uh, their incoming principal, Jonathan Gaspar, and was really impressed with his enthusiasm. And I know, um, having gone to Thornton Creek and hearing about their meeting last night, that that community is welcoming their new principal. And so I appreciate uh, everybody from Thornton Creek making that effort to be welcoming to him. I think that um, while John Minor has been such a great principal for that school for decades, um, I think it's exciting too to have some somebody new come in and provide some new energy around the work that the district is doing. So thank you to Thornton Creek for making uh, Principal Gaspar welcome. Um, all right, and again, um, I'm holding my community meetings most Tuesday mornings. I post either the night before or early in the morning on my Facebook page if it's going to be there. So all you need to do is check. It's from 8 to 9.30 at uh, Zoka on Blakely. It's a coffee shop um, and welcoming people there. One of the people who came to visit me um, was uh, one of the people from the Northeast uh, Little League, I think it is, Northeast Seattle Little League Association. I never remember what it's all for. And they made an ask for us to consider replacing their ability to provide um, a storage bin on school fields for the softball and baseball teams. So I'm passing that along. I understand that that was stopped um, due to an audit, but that it's something that I think we should think about and I say this now because I wonder if throughout the city other baseball leagues are facing the same thing and would also like to see some type of practical revision to our policy. We know the parks allow that and so I'm wondering if we at the schools can and if that's something that I want to hear if that's an issue throughout our district. Um, to uh, all the folks that showed up in support of an Indian Heritage High School, we need to hear more. I understand that this has been um, definitely something that Director Pinkham has put foremost. Um, again, I, I, as one, have hesitation to start pulling people out of our schools and putting them in one place when I think it's so much more important that we continue to look for ways to make sure that everybody's voice is heard and everybody's culture is respected in our schools. And by making any group not there, I, I, I hesitate, one, on everybody's ability to get to the school in order for them, or having to choose between that which is offered for their identity safety versus what is offered in a comprehensive setting, and also those voices being absent then from our comprehensive high schools. Because I understand that our comprehensive high schools are not safe places for everybody, but I don't think the solution is withdrawing from them because that doesn't change the comprehensive environment. And so it doesn't allow everybody to learn and struggle with the safety of the other individuals around them. That is my perspective. I'm not wet in it. I'm not said that I, I wouldn't be open to another view or vision, but it is something that I have a hard time with. So I will say it. I know it's known. I've said it before. This isn't anything new. And ethnic studies, yes. It should have been years ago, and I will continue to push it forward the best I can, both in terms of an individual individualized classes. I know Nova, for one, has a couple of those classes going um, where they have focused on uh, ethnic studies in different ways. Um, but I also think that we all continue to need to be con constantly vigilant in making sure that it is embedded up through elementary school, because I think even by high school, why should it be necessary to go through a class then when you should have been exposed all the way through your career? Um, okay, I please come and talk to me at my community meetings if you have things to share. Director DeWolf. <coughs> yes, thank you, President Harris. This is very loud. Thank you. 
Um, I just want to do some quick thanks before I get into some of the meat stuff. So just, um, again, thanks to the Vietnamese Friendship Association for your 40 years of service. Um, I was uh, really grateful to visit uh, Seattle World School this morning, and I know that they're one of the critical partners there, so I really appreciate their service and their commitment to our students. And I also was um, really grateful. If you could see down there, I was um, gifted um, some art from some of our students from Seattle World School and was really grateful, again, just to be there uh, and with those students, and so really proudly uh, uh, displaying that here. Um, also want to thank the Stevens Elementary Choir Five. Uh, my, my community when I was in high school, not too long ago, um, was my choir family. I was in three choirs in high school, so I am absolutely excited to see our folks coming out and singing. Um, I was definitely one of the folks dancing in the front row. Um, also wanted to thank Nova High School, Ellie, and then also Principal Mark Perry for having us on Friday last week. And I do just want to report for the record that the burrito bar is back. Um, so thank you to the folks at 609 and all the, all the leaders and everybody advocating at Nova. That's a big deal if you don't know about that. I just want to be very clear. That's really exciting <laughs> for our Nova students. Um, was uh, also really excited uh, and grateful to attend the Alliance for Education's l uh, luncheon today and just to celebrate the Seattle Teacher Residency Program. Um, again, if you don't know about this, this is the one of the partnerships we have with uh, Alliance for Education, UW, and Seattle Education, uh, Education Association, building a pipeline for teachers of color to be teachers in our school, and it's a really incredible program. And I know that we pitch in some support as much as we can with our scarce resources, but really proud to be a partner in that. Um, and then I just wanted to also mention the teachers that made a difference in my life um, because this is an opportunity. Uh, it is Teacher Appreciation Week. So Mrs. Lutz, Mrs. Lineweber, Mrs. Meredith, Mrs. Ringgold, Mrs. Schrader, Mrs. Fennessy, my choir teacher, Mrs. Sh Shalock, and Mr. Mickelson, all from um, Mead School District in Spokane. Um, I am visiting Daniel Begley on Friday with books. <laughs> Finally have this uh, scheduled. Thank you to the folks here for helping me schedule all that. And then also doing a visit to uh, Washington Middle School, also dropping off a book donation to their library, and then also visiting their food pantry. So looking forward to that on uh, Monday. And then next week we'll be visiting Middle College at Seattle U. And a couple of other random things. Um, C89.5, I, I think I talk about this every time. I don't know how or why. Um, but they just had their spring fund drive, and this is one of the programs of Seattle Public Schools. It's a CTE program. I'm really excited about it. I am a nerd and love, I listen to it all the time, though. So um, they did not reach their goal. Um, so I'm just encouraging folks to visit their website, c895.org. Um, if you feel so inclined or have the ability to donate, please do. It's a really incredible program for our students. Um, and I'd learned, this is just another, I would say, interesting fact, that Lady Gaga did get her start at CD95. It's recorded, it's pretty, it's at least known there, but I just wanted to be uh, very clear that um, we had a stake in, in that fame monster. Take her 10% too. We could use it. Um, I also wanted to draw attention, um, a couple weeks ago, OSPI released a report about student homelessness in our district. And I just wanted to read a line um, from the song that our students sang this morning, or not this morning, um, this earlier today, uh, from the song Don't Laugh At Me. And it's the, the lyrics are, I'm the beggar on the corner, you've passed me on the street, and I wouldn't be out here begging if I had enough to eat. And don't think I don't notice that our eyes never meet. I, um, this is one of the most uh, important issues for me in, in, in my role here on the board amongst uh, many of the other issues that come across our emails. Um, but there are 125 unsheltered students uh, that are students in Seattle Public Schools. This is um, a, a moral crime. And if we do not get our act together to do something about this, just, be, just know that every night that we get to go to sleep um, in our homes and 125 of our students are outside in cars. Um, and this is just a travesty, and I hope that we can come together on some solutions around this. 708 of those are unaccompanied minors, and 404 of the 4,280 st students that are experiencing homelessness, 400 of them, that's about 10%, are um, native students. So just to really drive the point home that this is actually a racial justice issue as well. Um, I wanted to um, share this news, and I tried to make sure that Leslie and Betty heard me before uh, I announced this, but we do have confirmation on the May 19th at 12 p.m. Um, at the Hing Hay Park Community Room. 
we're hosting a, a trifecta community meeting um, with some interpreters and, and organizing with our friends down at the uh, Skipta um, for interpreters there and getting some families out. So just an opportunity to make sure, and I want to be clear about something. I was uh, on social media a while ago and somebody had mentioned that um, my community meeting um, that I wanted to hold in the inter international district with families that needed interpreters was not real community. Um, and again, this is maybe just one person on, on social media, but, but um, that, that is also my community. Um, and if they don't look like you, that's, that's not a big deal, right? Every single person in my district is, is part of my community, and these folks particularly are often invisible and don't have their voices heard, so that's why we're organizing this one. Um, and then the last exciting news I wanted to share, um, I did get confirmation today from um, Mark Perry at Nova High School that on June 1st at 8 a.m. we will be hosting uh, a press event, media event, um, Leslie and Dr. Nyland also, these are pending um, in my out, outbox emails to you uh, about an event on June 1st at Nova High School at 8 a.m. we'll be raising, uh, it's a, plag a pride and trans pride flag raising event um, at Nova High School just to celebrate and um, center the experiences and uh, stories of our, of our LGBTQ and queer students. So hosting uh, an event there and then we'll also be um, flying the rainbow and trans pride flag here at the John Stanford Center for uh, June as well, which is Pride Month. Um, and then uh, lastly, because I know I've taken up a ton of time and I apologize, I, I, I appreciate uh, particularly all of our um, Native students. As a Native student myself, the only way that uh, I was able to um, find uh, community and feel visible in uh, when I was in public schools was uh, an organization called the Native Project in Spokane, an after school program and a summer program and a, and a spring leadership camp for Native youth. Um, so I understand um, how important this issue is not only to the folks that were here, but just to our communities, our Native communities. Two points that I want to really reiterate. Uh, Native people are not people of color. Native people are sovereign nations. We are our own independent and tribal nations. The second thing I want to just mention is that I do not want to make invisible the incredible work that we do with scarce resources that your state gives to us. Um, and I want to make sure that we elevate the fact that uh, Gail Morris does an incredible job for Native education in our district. And yes, we, do, we are not where we need to be. And please understand that the folks that came and spoke about the Indian Heritage High School are right. We're not serving all of our students well. But I do not want to let be it invisible the fact that Gail Morris does an incredible job serving the Native students in our district as well as she can with the scarce resources she has. So, so yes, we could do better, and we're doing <coughs> as well as we can. And I, and I just want to really um, thank you, Gail, for, for your work on that. Director Patu, I want to say thank you to everyone who actually have come tonight and testify and share with us uh, not only your opinion, but also your thoughts. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you also to the Stevens Elementary School Choir for such a great performance. I really, really enjoyed their performance. Those kids really sang their little hearts out. Um, and, and it's performers like that that actually that we need on the board on a regular basis to get us moving. So I uh, appreciate that from the Stephen Elementary School Choir. Thank you to all the teachers for their great work in our schools for this is uh, Teachers Week. I appreciate every one of them because without them, we wouldn't have uh, educators in our school to educate our children. And everything that they have to put up with, and I appreciate all that they do for our kids. Also, um, happy um, Asian Pacific uh, Islander uh, Heritage Month. Um, sometime, you know, being in America so long, you forget that uh, who you really are. And when they're celebrating Pacific Islander Month, I have to sit back and I said, oh, wait a minute, I'm Pacific Islander. <laughs> and, you know, remember that my dad always says, um, you never forget where you come from. So you always have to remember your culture and make sure that uh, that even your kids do not forget. So I appreciate um, the Asian Pacific uh, uh, American Heritage Month to remind us of who we are and what uh, contribution that we've actually have contributed to uh, this country. Thank you to the Vietnamese Friendship Association for your continued uh, support and partnership with our district. And congratulations to Emerson Elementary School 
We had a great visit yesterday, and it was really amazing to see uh, the academic work that has been happening at uh, Emerson. I know a year ago, I was a little concerned because of the chains over uh, in terms of the leadership of that school, but now after uh, the, we have actually visited this week, I'm really very impressed with what's happening at that school in terms of looking at the scores of a lot of our students at Emerson, and they're definitely uh, making a difference in the academics of a lot of the students at that school, and I appreciate the administration that's actually that's running that school and making sure that our kids are actually getting the education that they need, which is a wonderful thing. So congratulations, Emerson, and all the administration and the staff that actually makes that happen, and also for the parents and community that supports that school. Um, I would also like to say thank you to Gian and Essence for continuing to coming to the board and keeping us uh, uh, really in terms of keeping us accountable and knowledgeable in terms of what Rainier Beach needs. And I know that for years we've been talking about uh, uh, getting Rainier Beach to be renovated. And even though we're on the Vex 5 right now, for how long, I don't know. I'm gonna have to keep an eye on that because every year I put it on there and every year it comes off. So this year I told them that, I told the students I'm gonna be watching Bex 5 every, uh, this year to make sure that Rainier Beach actually gets its renovation when the time comes. So hopefully that Rainier Beach will be getting a, a new school in the new years to come. Um, and um, it's something that we've been working on for years. So we're keeping an eye out to make sure that the district does not diss us again, that we'll be able to get our new buildings for Rainier Beach High School is the only high school that has not been renovated. So it's time we get our renovation and we're gonna make sure that happens. Um, it's also, I would like to, um, to it's really have been, um, as I think about how long I've been on the board, my kids were just telling me, mom, you've been on the district, you've been on the board for too long. <laughs> and because my birthday's coming up and I'm not gonna say how old I'm getting there. <laughs> And I realized, I said, yeah, I've been there for a long time. And they said, don't you think it's time to quit? And I said, no, not time yet. I still got three more years left. And hopefully, as the years go by, it'll get more exciting. I'm not as excited right now, but I think that, you know, as every year, every month becomes a new month and a new year, to be excited about new things that's happening and we're getting a new superintendent and I'm just looking forward to a lot of great things happening at the district as we continue on our journey with all the board directors up here. And I believe that as people would ask me, well, how's the new, all the board directors? And I, what I tell every one of them is that we have a board directors sitting on this board that have hearts for kids and wanna make sure that every student in Seattle Public School gets its excellent education and to make sure that we're here to help support that. So I'm really proud of the boy that I sit on right now because I'm an oldie but goodies. I've been <laughs> I'm the longest board director sitting on here right now and I've been through it all. But you know what, it's a great experience and it's a really a blessing to be here and help make changes so we can actually provide the excellent education that all our students in Seattle Public School deserve. So thank you for continuing to come and support us even though sometimes you want to throw rocks at us, but that's okay. We're here because of the kids. And we make mistakes, but I think that together we can really be able to make a difference in the lives of all our students here in Seattle Public School. So thank you. Thank you. Director Mack. <coughs> I think I want to start first by thanking all of the teachers Again, they've gotten a lot of appreciation these last couple of weeks. I know we kind of have two weeks because it's supposed to be the first full week of May, but it got split. Some schools are celebrating last week and this week. And um, I'm really grateful that teachers are getting a lot of uh, treats and appreciation because they do a really hard job and they love our students. Today at um, the luncheon we attended, um, the speaker, Hermaine, if, if I'm saying that, uh, correctly, who teaches at Lowell, um, so inspiring to hear the love, the love that our teachers put into our students every day. Um, so thank you, each and every one of you, 
6,000 of them that we have. Is that the right number? So thank you. Um, the other thing that's really important for our kids to have a great education is really great facilities, buildings. Like where you go to school, that environment matters. It matters a lot, which is where a lot of my brain has been in terms of working to help plan around the capacity of our buildings. We've got some challenges we're looking at next year. Some of our high schools are gonna be incredibly overloaded. Um, Ballard is looking at over 2,000 students as an example. Um, and in order to solve these challenges, we've got to lock arms and work together because I believe that every student in, the dis in this district deserves a great educational environment. Um, and so we're working on um, the next Bex levy coming up and we've got a couple bars um, in front of us tonight that I'm looking forward to hopefully passing around our guiding principles um, for the Bex levy um, as well as um, task force support in our planning around that. Um, and I am uh, visiting Ballard uh, next week as well. I'm looking forward to meeting with the librarians there and um, some other folks. Um, and I think, oh, I have a community meeting this Saturday. So Mother's Day is Sunday, but Saturday. Where Magnolia Library uh, at one o'clock, one to three. So thank you. Thank you. To our student guests, if you all would like to speak, Jean, in essence, to what you heard during public testimony, you're welcome to do so now. Okay, so for the, I just had a question regarding the Ameri the Native American Heritage School. So, um, I, well, first I was wondering why it was closed, um, and then it's just an open question. And what makes it different from other high schools? Like, is it just that, or are other students as well able to be, go, able to go to that high school, or is it just specifically Native American students? We don't have enough time in this meeting to go over the last 20 okay. years, but I would suggest that our Director of Indian Education, Gail Morris, can you wave, please? If you could see her during the break, that would be helpful. Also, uh, there's a white paper out there on the website, and um, I believe that Directors Pinkham and DeWolf would be more than happy to speak to you as well. And, and I appreciate the question, we just don't have the time. And may I also ask further questions later on if I, okay. Absolutely. Essence, would you like to address any of the issues that you heard from public testimony? Oh no, my questions are there, I'll ask them afterwards. Okay, terrific, thank you. Director Pinkham, you had some um, more comments after public testimony, yes. sir. Please. Yeah, again, Katsiaya. Uh, I want to thank everyone that came here and presented the, their, the comments and concerns that are hitting our community now. And again, if you don't come here and share those voices and share your what, what you see as an issue for you, you won't, you won't see results. And I know sometimes it's frustrating. I've been here before. I keep on saying this, just like the uh, <coughs> native students that came here, we've been asking for this for a while. Uh, ethnic studies, yes, it is time, because yes, I remember going through my high school years and stuff, and it was all Eurocentric. Uh, Christopher Columbus discovered America, the great expansion, the manifest destiny, and it really marginalized the indigenous people that were here. You know, like, wait, did, wasn't there someone here that Columbus didn't just discover it? Maybe we discovered Columbus, because apparently he was lost. He thought he was going to India. Uh, and you, you, you didn't learn about things until I actually hit college and you start learning stuff and University of Washington didn't have an American Indian Studies. It does now. And it allows, you know, the students that have come, uh, uh, excuse me, let me back up. Students that have uh, presented in here in the past talked about, I never knew that there was such thing as ethnic studies until I got to college. You know, why do I have to wait until then? You know, let's, let's get the ethnic studies definitely rolling and uh, helping our students out to know that there's more than one perspective out there. And as Director Yuri said, uh, her fear is that a native-focused high school may take away the voice 
uh, but right now their voices aren't being heard. And, do, and we keep on asking and saying, so, well, we're not being, being heard, and we've been trying to get that. And we have a program now down at Chief South and um, Denny, the Shaquachi. Did I pronounce it right? Not, not even close. <laughs> She's like, no. <laughs> uh, and, but that's just one school that we have. It. And then we have staff with our Huchusa program that are trying to help out the best that they can, but we got students spread across all 100 schools, and it is tough. And this is you know, a program and service, and if our students that need it can't get access to it, that's one way they say, well, maybe a native option school would help. You know, so students that do need it can get access to it. Those that opt to not attend, you know, they, don't, they, don't, they can opt out, because there are native students out there that feel, no, I want to go to this school. I want to go to Ballard. I want to go to Roosevelt. But I've come across more students that say, I need a school where I can feel safe. And this isn't a school that, as uh, John was asking, that wouldn't just be for Native students. No, it wouldn't, you know, no, no, sorry, you're not Native, you can't come. But I see it as a school that would be Native-focused in the sense that, as I mentioned before, it'd be focused on community. How can we welcome everyone? You know, how did the Pilgrims survive when they first got here? It was the Natives that welcomed them and say, hey, here, here's how I can survive the harsh summer. How did Lewis and Clark make it to the coast? Tribes helped them out, you know, hey, Here's some new people amongst us. Let's help them out. So there is, I feel, within that Native community, a sense of welcoming. You come, sit at our table, have something to eat. You're our guests here. We're guests on <coughs> Duwamish land right now. And let's acknowledge that. And that's, <coughs> i got to put my glasses on. My Listening to my daughter and my wife speak brought tears to my eyes. Um, so now I get kind of choked up again. So the reason I want to support this, not as an amendment, but I want to see it as its own bar <coughs> so it can be properly vetted, so we can look into, you know, hopefully address some issues that other board members may have, and also not to take away from the current bar and the expansion of Native American services. But note that there is still much more, I think, that we can do to help our Native students. And it isn't, again, just helping the Native students, it will help all students. Because as Director DeWolf mentioned, um, Tom Spears mentioned with a, a letter that we're not ethnic identifies, we're not a racial category, we're sovereign nations. We're a political identity. Um, <coughs> so by having this as a separate bar, I feel that that'll better acknowledge you know, what I'm asking for. It acknowledges Seattle and our schools are in Duwamish, Coast Salish land, allows our community to learn the history of this place because knowing the history from a native perspective of these traditional lands is needed. Uh, identity safety for first people of this land and inclusiveness of people from all backgrounds. Indian Heritage High School did not have a 100% graduation rate, uh, but they did have 100% of their seniors that started a couple of years did graduate. All the seniors that started the school finished uh, two years in a row, and one year, 100% of them went on to higher education. Um, so the success there. And for when we say, yes, they didn't have a great graduation rate, but a lot of the students that went to Indian Heritage School would have failed out of the school they were at in the first place. So any one of those that they were able to finish was a success. Yes, they didn't graduate. 100% of them that came there probably before their senior year, but any one that they did was a success. <coughs> uh, it would focus on, again, education mentioned this before, that'll better the community rather than industry, and it'll still, I think, better industry in the long run because we're gonna bring broader perspectives to industry. You know, we need broader perspectives in technology, broader perspectives <coughs> in government action right now too to, to let people know we are here we're a diverse community we need everyone's voice to make ourselves better uh, new high school <coughs> uh, as an option school it can allow families to opt in to attend not saying it's a necessary school that's where you have to go but as an option school allows parents that choice and I hope it then becomes a beacon to, so to other schools look at what can happen when we have a school that's more open to community having that native focus acknowledging the land that we're on it's gonna say something, I think, very mighty for the um, <coughs> Seattle schools. So that's what I want to share, and as I go from here, I'll be talking to other uh, directors here to see who wants to help support me on uh, moving this bar forward. Katsi Ayo. Director Burke, you had comments. I, I already said my piece, but I just wanted to put a quick add on. I wanna thank everyone for their testimony, and I, I believe my colleagues have 
have gone in detail on that and as, as eloquent as I could offer, so I thank them for that. But I just want to really emphasize, before I sat here, I sat there, and I stood behind that podium and addressed directors and kind of felt the nerves and thought to myself, are they listening? Do they care? Am I wasting my time? And I just want to tell you you're not. It's not a waste of time. Your stories have a lot of meaning for me and what I hear from my colleagues as well is that um, it's, it's, it's emotional. So I just wanted to restate that and you know that my, my gratitude for you taking the time and sharing your stories and, and, and thoughts and suggestions and detailed lists with us to help us uh, do a better job of what we do. Um, and then in my initial comments, I neglected to thank um, Essence John. We're gonna miss you. You have, you've helped shape the dynamic, you know, just like I was talking about the, the, the public testimony, the, some of the, the work that you've done, the messaging you've done, the rest of, the rest of your team there. Um, you know, congratulations and at, at Cornish, that's gonna be awesome. University of Washington, that's gonna be awesome. I, I got my engineering degree from UW, so. It, it's, it, it works you, for me. You'll be giving him an internship, will you? The possibilities are endless. Um, so I think we'll, we'll, your, your, your legacy is safe with us, and I hope that you'll continue to visit us um, and tell us how, how Seattle schools helped or where we left gaps um, as you move forward because we want all kids to succeed. Okay, last but not least. Um, I echo the thank yous and enhance them from my colleagues. The student performances are a bright light and they give us the fuel to move forward. And um, I think at some point this board's gonna sing back. Um, <laughs> Game on, <laughs> game on. And I understand that Director DeWolf with his Ooh. choral background will be happy to coach and conduct. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gian and Essence, thanks very much for being here. But mostly thank you for your commitment to your fellow students and for social justice and speaking up and getting counted. It's, it's terribly important, and, and y'all are extraordinary role models, and we thank you. Um, May 28th, Del Ridge Library, three to five, and we're to three of three, so we're serving lasagna. And I invite you, I invite staff. It's rowdy, it's good, it's thoughtful, and um, you know, we can have a couple of other board members join us as well. Be, be lovely to see you. Tomorrow night, scholarship awards. Um, it is awe-inspiring what our students have been through, where they're going, how they got here, and I triple dog dare you not to lose a lot of tears on this because it's, it's from the heart and it's extraordinary. The scholarship committee is, is frankly the most fun I have as a board directors sitting on that committee with the retired teachers and community members, it's, it's a blast. Miramore Art Show, it's at Seattle Art Museum. Uh, our students' talent is, is awe-inspiring and amazing and I encourage you to see that. I uh, wanna say thank you, especially to the folks at Concord that came to testify tonight. Dr. Zavella and your team and your teachers and your community, Robin, Hillary. Um, it's been a long year, but you guys have fought hard. You've come up with thoughtful solutions. Your research paper is most impressive, and it is absolutely an equity issue. And um, to be continued, whether or not we can backfill that money. No one has said no yet. And as far as I'm concerned, until they say no, it's still game on. Uh, to the folks at Rocks Hill that I met with this morning, uh, the naming convention will be Rocks Hill Elementary at E.C. Hughes. And um, Tara Patrick, amazing principal, 
and Helen Young. Good, good meeting, thoughtful meeting. Uh, again, remind folks that tomorrow is the deadline for the Information Technology Advisory Committee. If you care about things like money, if you care about things like online or blended learning, um, get your applications in. This is the kind of committee that will help inform decisions that will push us for the next 20 years, and they're absolutely equity decisions. Um, the Advanced Learning Task Force applications are up. Encourage folks to put their time and their effort uh, where their concerns are. Uh, we are still working on the Moss Adams audit. We hope to have that done before the end of June. And to any administrative staff that haven't returned the phone calls, I now have the list. And I'll be coming for you. Um, it's, it's terribly important that we do that right. And it's a question of transparency, trust, and learning ways that we can get better at what we do. And terribly important, given the levies coming up, especially with the city's big levy in November, families and education levy. If you care about these things, the Seattle Channel has all of those hearings with the city council, all of the mayor's pronouncements, and it's a big ask. And then four months later, we're gonna have BEX-5 and our operations levy. And contrary to fake news that McCleary solved all of our problems, contrary to the fact that Seattle homeowners and the middle class have all the money in the world to spend on property taxes, which are the most inequitable kinds of taxes, um, it's, it's going to matter that we all, as my colleague Director Mack said, lock elbows and make this happen. We have a capacity crisis. The operations levy is up to 20% of our general fund, and, and that's a disaster waiting to happen. So, so we need to um, get busy, get organized, and get loud. Um, at the work session, a couple of things <laughs> came to light. One, that option schools, or as I like to call them, alternative schools, had the longest wait lists. And when we talk about replicating good practices, I would suggest that that might be a place to look. Second, we found out that a number of our alternative learning experience, ALE schools, are still called quote unquote service schools in our student assignment plan. And frankly, I find the term offensive. I find it labeling and I wonder why we wonder that our enrollment is down in places like middle college high school, Nova, Southlake, interagency. They are not necessarily just, quote unquote, just safety net schools. They are continuously enrolled option schools. And, and again, if we set the table for a preconceived result, why are we in fact surprised? And I'm told by senior staff that we're gonna change that, that it is not going to take a Harris resolution to do so. Um, and and it, it distresses me greatly. Um, teachers that made a difference in my life, because as I'm sure you're surprised, I was an outlier student. Um, Mrs. Cook realized that I liked to read and I lived at the library, so she gave me progressively harder books. And she let me sit in the corner and read. And she inspired me and she pushed me. And I had a visual communications teacher, Sten Nord, back in Silver Spring, Maryland, when I was a fish out of water because I'm a Seattle native and I did not fit culturally or otherwise, who um, 
gave me the gift of photography, gave me the gift of um, visual arts. I can still run a multi-lit 1260 if they even still make them in letterpress. And um, this was a teacher when I moved back here, offered to fly me back for a college scholarship on his own dime. And it's teachers like that that make sure our kids live to see another day and believe in themselves when they don't believe in themselves. And to every teacher in our district and everywhere else, I salute you and I am inspired by you. It's an honor and a pleasure to serve with these folks and with the folks who work for this district. It's important work. Sometimes it really sucks, but uh, we're doing our best. And when you send criticism our way, please make it constructive criticism. Thank you. Mr. General Counsel and Assistant Superintendent Dr. Codd, if you could come address the consent calendar consent uh, agenda issue with respect to personnel items that were brought up during public testimony, I'd be grateful. And then after we take that vote, we're taking a 15 minute break. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, thank you. So um, the teacher qualification report is actually the first report that OSPI has developed since No Child Left Behind legislation ended. Um, they are fully aware uh, that it is a flawed report. They are making refinements to the report. Uh, they send us this report mid-year. Um, what is listed in front of you are teachers who are not new to the district. These are teachers we've had. They're fully certified. They may be out of endorsement. For example, a language arts teacher is teaching reading, has a language arts endorsement, doesn't have a reading endorsement. A teacher who's teaching physics has a chemistry, biology, science endorsement, is working on their physics endorsement. Um, those are all listed in the personnel report. But additionally, you will see ELL teachers who are working in an inclusion setting that show as out of endorsement because OSBI does not differentiate between ELL or general ed. You will also see teachers who have substitute certificates, which qualifies you to teach any subject K-12, but OSPI has a backlog. They have not uploaded those sub-certificates, so they show it's out of endorsements. Um, I'll turn it over to Noel to explain the, the legal ramifications of this, which I don't think are. Yeah, Noel Treat, General Counsel. Um, so the issue, of course, is that uh, we are now getting board approval for these out of uh, certified subject teachers. They're, they're certified, but they're not, they don't have the endorsement for the subject matter they might be teaching now. As Clover indicated, we get the report from OSPI late um, that tells us that in some scenarios. The, uh, contrary to what, what was stated, I think the, this, is, this comes up in an OSPI regulation, not in a state statute. It is up to OSPI whether we're in compliance or not. The regulation is not entirely clear as to when the board has to approve and if it, if, if it can be retroactive or not. But to date, it appears that OSPI historically has been fine with retroactive approval um, given the status of the reporting that goes on. So I don't see a legal problem with approving the personnel report um, under this scenario. The, the other alternative is when we receive this report from OSPI mid-year, we could remove the teachers from the classroom, fill it with substitutes until we can come to the board meeting, get them approved on the personnel report, and then put those teachers back in the classroom. I don't know that that's in the best interest of our students or the families that we serve, but that would be one alternative. Director Mack, you had a question, ma'am? Yeah, I'm sorry, just kind of going back to the very vast tax of what this is and what we're talking about. Endorsements are um, like certification, if I understand it correctly. They're not certification, but they're, you get an endorsement because you have focused on a certain area. Certain area, subject area. Okay, yes. And so, that information gets reported from the teachers to OSPI and then they turn around and report it back to the district? Yes, they do. Um, and, and what may happen is a teacher who was teaching chemistry last year, the principal has put them in the master schedule to teach physics this year. They're working on their physics endorsement. They don't yet have it. We have no way of knowing that they're now teaching physics versus chemistry until after the fact. There's no way we could get ahead of this ahead of time. 
it's okay for them to be teaching physics without the physics endorsement. We just must report them out. They're fully certified teachers. I, I'm trying to personally understand why there's even a rule around it. Me too. And so it, to me, it, well, it kind of makes sense to me, though, that you know, if we were having teachers doing teaching subjects that they're not endorsed in, that it would be good to know that. Um, so it sounds like that's the intent behind the regulation. It's to make you aware. And but they but when the teachers report this to OSPI, they're not reporting it to the district, so we don't get that information at the same time. Yes and no. This is an old report left over from No Child Left Behind where it was an absolute requirement to report on out of endorsement teachers. So this is somewhat of a legacy report that they're now refining to adjust to the um, the Every Student Succeeds Act. There are many problems with this report. Again, the only alternative I see is to receive the report from OSPI, remove the teachers, get approval, put them back, which could be maybe a, a two-week turnaround. I, I personally don't think that's a great option. Um, I'm just more, I'm more interested in um, how many out of endorsement teachers do we have and it is a better strategy to ensure that when we we know that these are out of endorsement teachers that they are a working on the endorsement or it's a funky thing where they really have that qualification it's just they don't have the endorsement yeah so in the personnel report we've listed every single one that is out of endorsement we've put notes behind it what the reason is and some of them are just data entry Course codes don't match up with our course codes, with OSBR course codes. So it's all, uh, we also track each one of these. We contact each teacher. If you're teaching physics this year, you must get your physics endorsement if you're going to teach it next year. So we're fully aware of each one of these um, out of endorsement teachers. Um, and we're working with OSBI to also clean up the data. So how many, what's, like, what's the percentage of our teaching population that is out of endorsement at this stage? According to the report, it would be 10% because 400 teachers, about f we have about 4,000. But again, out of those 400, many of them, they're not actually out of endorsed teachers. The data is incorrect. Okay, great, thank you. Director DeWolf. Uh, I was gonna s <coughs> I was just gonna say, if you just kind of read through them, for example, there's a teacher from Garfield CT teacher with multiple related endorsements and is, con is seeking computer science, it's a hard position to fill. So there's just some nuance, I think, too, to these. Director Pinkham. So, so you're saying we'd have to get the report from OSPI? So I think, why aren't we finding out first? When you say, we know, but and then if it says in here that local, vote of the local school board, so how come we're not hearing about it? So teachers apply for certification endorsements through SPI. They don't apply through Seattle Public Schools. So there's a lag between the time a teacher gets their endorsement, reports it to OSPI, OSPI reports it back to us. When we hire new teachers, we don't actually hire them into any position that they don't already have an endorsement in. So that, you know, that's a hard, fast rule. We don't allow you to um, be hired into something you're not endorsed in. But w we would have no way of knowing that a principal decided to um, have Mr. DeWolf teach physics this school year and they taught chemistry last year. We wouldn't know that at the start of the school year. We will know it mid midway through the school year. So that's what we're dealing with here. So is there a way then for us to find out from the principals and hey, I'm going to have <laughs> Mr. DeWolf teach physics even though he's endorsed for chemistry? Why do we have to wait until the report goes to OSPI for it to get back to us? So is there a better way for us to track this, I guess I'm trying to get to? I'm not aware, and I also don't feel fully capable of answering these questions on the spot from the dais, to be quite honest. I would need to talk with our Department of Technology Services. Uh, uh, this is a power school issue. This is a reporting issue. This is one bureaucracy talking to another bureaucracy. And so I just, I really don't feel comfortable answering these questions in, in, in an intelligent way. And, and I guess I would just add, our understanding is OSPI is well aware that these, uh, that this board approval does come retroactively at times. They've, to our knowledge, never raised that as a compliance concern. Um, and I, 
I don't see any legal risk given the way the rules are written about retroactively approving these endorsements. One question and one comment. One, legal risk. It's my recollection that this particular issue caused us a great deal of harm and harm to the University of Washington Middle College High School program when we had a teacher that was quote unquote teaching out of endorsement area but doing so with the assistance of a professor at the University of Washington and we recently settled a grievance on that fact. So I, I beg to differ, personal knowledge. Second, if we don't approve the personnel report this evening in a moment or not, what is the ramification, pray tell? If, you, if these have come before you, if you do not approve them, we will go back to HR tomorrow. We will send a letter to these teachers saying they are not approved to be teaching in the classroom. We will remove them. We will find substitutes to replace them. And remember, a substitute can teach any course with a substitute certificate. They're not endorsed in the subject areas. And then once we figure out a way to get them approved or fixed, we would then put them back in the classroom. I really don't see another way around this. I, and I appreciate that, but I think it's my job to bring up worst case scenarios. Jian, did you wish to ask a question or comment? Yeah, I just wanted to Thank share you. an experience, preferably not to remove teachers halfway through the year, because we've had, um, this is a personal experience from this year, where we've had a math teacher who was teaching an IB class, and I'm guessing this is what happened to him, was that he was out of endorsement, and so he was, um, take so he didn't so he it was an IB math class and he was taken out of it I'm guessing because he was out of endorsement and we've had substitutes and so students that learned the way that he was the with his teaching style their learning was disrupted and so their um well I'm guessing their math exams which they took this week would be lower because they didn't like just this whole substitute thing it's not gonna work out is just what I'm saying thank you very much Question, is it possible that we can get a report on this, say, within the next 30 days as a follow-up if we were to vote to accept this personnel report? Of course. That's a yes? Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion to approve the consent uh, agenda, please? I move approval of the consent agenda. Second the motion. All those in favor of the consent agenda, which includes the personnel report as written, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying no. The consent agenda and the personnel report has been passed with promise we'll get a 30-day report. We are going to take a break for 15 minutes, be back here at 7.35. Thank you very much.